this week's Vaticano, Pope Francis receives the prestigious Charlemagne Prize in the Vatican. Rome's March for Life draws thousands of people standing up for the rights of pre-born children. All this plus the relics of two lesser-known apostles are being venerated in Rome. For this and more, stay tuned. You're watching Vaticano. On May the 6th, Pope Francis received one of the most prestigious European awards, the 2016 Charlemagne Prize. With this gesture, Europe recognizes his tireless work for peace and integration on the continent. In the Sala Regia of the Apostolic Palace, before an audience of a king, ambassadors, and political and economic leaders, the Pope issued a challenge to Europe to create a new European humanism, for which he said three elements are needed, memory, value, and a commitment to the common good. What has happened to you, the Europe of humanism, the champion of human rights, democracy, and freedom? What has happened to you, Europe, the home of poets, philosophers, artists, musicians, and men and women of letters? What has happened to you, Europe, the mother of peoples and nations, the mother of great men and women who upheld and even sacrificed their lives for the dignity of their brothers and sisters? Creativity and genius are capable for rebirth and renewal are part of the soul of Europe. In the last century, Europe bore witness to humanity that a new beginning was indeed possible. After years of tragic conflicts culminating in the most horrific war ever known, there emerged, by God's grace, something completely new in human history. The ashes of the ruins could not extinguish the ardent hope and the quest of solidarity that inspired the founders of the European project. They laid the foundations for a bastion of peace, an edifice made up of states, united not by force, but by free commitment to the common good and a definitive end to confrontation. Europe, so long divided, finally found its true self and began to build its house. During his speech, the Holy Father strongly criticized the attitude of modern Europe, which seemingly has lost its capacity for dialogue and integration. The identity of Europe is, and always has been, a dynamic and multicultural identity. There is an impression that Europe is declining, that it has lost its ability to be innovative and creative, and that it is more concerned with preserving and dominating spaces than with generating process of inclusion and change. There is an impression that Europe is tending to become increasingly entrenched rather than open to initiating new social processes capable of engaging all individuals and groups in the search for new and productive solutions to current problems. Europe, rather than protecting spaces, is called to be a mother who generates process. Before leaving, the Holy Father explained his dream for the future of Europe. I dream of a Europe that is young, still capable of being a mother, a mother who has life because she respects life and offers hope for life. I dream of a Europe that cares for children, that offers fraternal help to the poor and the newcomers seeking acceptance because they have lost everything and need shelter. I dream of a Europe that is attentive to and concerned for the infirm and the elderly, lest they be simply set aside and useless. I dream of a Europe where being a migrant is not a crime, but summons us to greater commitment on behalf of the dignity of every human being. As part of the award, the Pope received a medal with the image of Charlemagne and a symbolic prize of 5,000 euros. On Sunday, the Feast of the Ascension, before the prayer of the Regina Celli, Pope Francis asked the faithful to be witnesses of the Gospel every day. We contemplate the mystery of Jesus, who leaves us earthly space to enter into the plenitude of the glory of God, taking with him our humanity. Our humanity enters for the first time into heaven. The Gospel of Luke shows us the reaction of the disciples before the Lord, who parted from them 
and was taken up to heaven. After the prayer, Pope Francis also recalled the importance of communicating mercy on World Communications Day. Today is the 50th World Day of Communication, established by the Second Vatican Council. In fact, the Council Fathers, reflecting on the Church in the modern world, understood the crucial importance of communication that can build bridges between individuals and within families, social groups and people. This is possible both in the material world and in the digital world. I offer everyone in the field of communication a warm greeting and I hope that our way of communicating in the Church always has a clear evangelical style, a style that unites the truth with mercy. On May the 2nd, Pope Francis received the director of the Cervantes Institute, Victor Garcia, in audience. In this encounter, Garcia gave the Pope the latest edition of Don Quixote from Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, who this year marks the 400th anniversary since his death. The Holy Father mentioned that he had read this masterpiece as a teenager. They also gave the pontiff the first edition of the dictionary of the Spanish Royal Academy of Language. Before the general audience, on Wednesday the 4th of May, Pope Francis met with participants in meetings between the Royal Institute for Interfaith Studies of Amman, Jordan, and the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue from the Vatican. It was the fourth meeting of the two institutions, and they discussed the theme, Shared Values in Social and Political Life, Citizens and Believers. Reminding his listeners that they have a common father and therefore are brothers, the Pope encouraged the participants to go forward on the path of dialogue. Pope Francis received about 9,000 doctors and volunteers from the Italian group Doctors with Africa in audience on May the 8th. The group is the first NGO to work in the field of health care officially recognized in Italy in the 1950s. The pontiff reminded them that the church is a field hospital and he praised their work across Africa. In the way of these great testimonies of missionary spirit and closeness which are fruitful in communicating the gospel, go forward with courage in your work and show that the church is not a super clinic for VIPs but moreover a field hospital. The church has a great heart and is close to many wounded and humiliated of history and in the service of the poorest. I assure you my closeness and my prayer. Doctors with Africa carry out their mission in seven African countries, Angola, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Sierra Leone, South Sudan, Tanzania, and Uganda. On May the 9th, Pope Francis received the members of the St. Peter's Circle, an audience in the Clementine Hall in the Apostolic Palace. The Pope expressed his gratitude and appreciation for the work they do every day as an expression of an outgoing church. A church that journeys to seek, visit, meet, hear, share and stay with the poorest people. The circle was founded in 1869 by young nobility in Rome in order to help poor people of the city with their motto of prayer, action, sacrifice. The circle is also responsible for the Peter's Pence offering collected around the world for the Pope's charity. Stay with us. After the break, we'll be back with more Vaticano. Thanks for watching. This is Vaticano. During this Jubilee year dedicated to mercy, Pope Francis has given and continues to give concrete examples of the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. On May the 5th, it was the turn of the seventh of the spiritual works of mercy, Comfort the Afflicted. At six o'clock in the afternoon at the Basilica of St. Peter's, Pope Francis celebrated a prayer vigil that was meant to dry the tears of those who need comfort. During the meeting, hundreds of faithful prayed alongside the Holy Father in front of the reliquary of Our Lady of Tears from Syracuse, Italy, on display especially for the occasion. Passages from the Bible were read amongst testimonies that visibly touched those present. Among them, there was an Italian couple with children. Five years ago, this family lived in unimaginable pain. The oldest of the siblings committed suicide at the age of 15. After a first stage of desperation and rage, they discovered the consoling mercy of Christ and through it managed to move forward with hope. 
After each story, a candle was lit next to the reliquary of the Virgin of Tears, faced with the suffering of these people. In his meditation, Pope Francis said that only in prayer can the human being find the true medicine to give meaning to suffering. In prayer, we too can feel God's presence. The tenderness of his gaze comforts us, the power of his word supports us and gives us hope. Reason by itself is not capable of making sense of our deepest feelings, appreciating the grief we experience and providing the answers we are looking for. At times like these, more than ever do we need the reason of the heart, which alone can help us understand the mystery which embraces our loneliness. We need the mercy, the consolation that comes from the Lord. All of us need it. This is our poverty, but also our grandeur, to plead for the consolation of God, who in his tenderness comes to wipe the tears from our eyes. The ceremony continued with a collection of personal prayers of the faithful taken to the feet of Our Lady. At the end of the vigil, the Holy Father gave out an object of devotion used in previous Jubilee years, known as Agnes Day. Pope Francis blessed them and gave them to ten people as a symbol of comfort and hope. Among those selected, he included a mother who had lost a son in a car accident, another person who had lost a relative at work, one who had lost relatives in the genocide in Rwanda, and yet another who was imprisoned. On Sunday, May the 6th, thousands participated in Italy's sixth annual National March for Life. Bishops, priests, nuns, and countless families marched across Rome from the Church of Santa Maria in Cosmedine along Piazza Venezia over the Tiber River to the Vatican. Oh, kind of watching the march go by, which is part of the intention of the march, you know, to kind of interrupt people's normality. And while they're having their, their uh, gelato or their cappuccino and say, hey, what is all this about? And it's an opportunity and, you know, to engage without engaging. The participants stand for life without compromise and want to bring attention to the six million babies who have been aborted in Italy since the legalization of abortion in 1978. Also in the most recent document on the family, Amoris Laetitia, Pope Francis condemns abortion with the words, no alleged right to one's own body can justify a decision to terminate life, which is an end in itself and which can never be considered the property of another human being. You know, I think that really the biggest challenge is a sense of indifference. You know, and, and what I mean by that is that because abortion has become as legal in so many parts of the world, and that we see even where it's not legal, groups pushing abortion and, and pushing the, uh, the agenda, and you know, that, that people have just kind of accepted the fact, well, this is just the way it is. You know, what can we do about it? How can we change the conversation? I personally like to use the word violence when I talk about abortion, because in people's minds, when something has been legalized, it's no longer criminal, it's no longer violent. Well, it's an unjust law, and it's, it's, it's a crime. It's a violence against life, and we need to teach people that language. So that really is the big challenge. The enthusiasm among the people was tangible. They stand up for true love and the protection of life. At the end of the march, the crowd reached St. Peter's Square, where they were greeted by Pope Francis. During this holy year of mercy, we could probably say that millions of indulgences have already been earned passing through the holy doors worldwide. Cardinal Mauro Piacenza, head of the Apostolic Penitentiary, the Tribunal of Mercy, explains to us exactly what indulgences are. Indulgences take away the fruit, in the truest sense of the word, the punishment for the sin which remains. We could say the consequences that follow sin and the punishment that's tied to sin. Always with this as a background, we think about the sanctity of God and the lack of equilibrium that is created with sin. 
It's precisely this reason why God is merciful and why He gives us this possibility. An indulgence, so to speak, sweeps away all the residue of sin, that is, the, the penalty which we have to pay for our sin in general. What's sometimes said is, what you don't pay here, you pay there, which means that suffering can either be offered up here or in purgatory. But why is the physical act of crossing the door necessary? Is it not enough to go to confession? With the proper disposition, you enter into the house of the Lord, that is, our house, because the inner church represents the heavenly Jerusalem, paradise, the house with God. It's a symbol that helps us to remain in harmony with our own faith and that recalls us back to our own faith, and in brief also the social aspect of the faith, that it's not just a philosophy and can't just be lived in private, but it's always lived in community. So it gives a sense of belonging to a people, that it's a type of community or a religious family. In order to obtain the indulgence, true repentance and confession are needed. The inner conversion is central, not just the outer movement. Confession needs, as we all know, penance, the acknowledgement of sin and the acceptance of the penance that is given, as well as the disposition to not fall into the sin again. But naturally, as is clear, human fragility can give us that experience which we unfortunately have every day, that we fall again. But it is important to get back up and to always have the will to follow Christ and not any ideology. In this year of mercy, thousands of holy doors were opened around the world, not only in cathedrals or churches, also in airports, train stations, hospitals, prisons, factories, and others. Pope Francis himself opened the very first one this Jubilee year. That was in Bangui, the capital of the Central African Republic, in November of 2015. He continues to encourage use of this special time of grace, and he follows up, giving his own example of how to do it. Stay tuned. After the break, we'll be back with more Vaticano. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. On May the 3rd, the Church celebrates the two apostles, James the Lesser and Philip. Their mortal remains are present in Rome in this church, the Basilica of the Most Holy Twelve Apostles. The Basilica is very old, 1,500 years. That which we organize here goes back straight to what has happened 1,500 years ago. That means how Pope Pelagius from Constantinople brought over the relics of Philip and Jacob to this place. They are the basis and the reason for this great basilica. He carried them as voto for the peace in the church. The relics are kept in the crypt below the main altar. A restoration project has started to renew it and to restore the frescoes, which have been damaged significantly due to humidity and age. These relics have been here for 1,500 years, here and were rediscovered in 1873. Then a great crypt had been erected to keep them. We have initiated the restoration work in the great crypt and we have realized that there is a great humidity down there and that was the stadium of the relics. So we had arranged a reconditionment of them. So since then we have rearranged them. But from May 3rd to the 15th we have taken the relics and offered them here for veneration. And that is the principal reason why they are on display here. Now everybody that comes to the Basilica has the chance to venerate the relics which are on display in one of the side chapels. The two apostles were fundamental for the spreading of the faith in the early church. James the Lesser, cousin of Jesus, is author of the letter that is called Letter of James. He was the first bishop of Jerusalem. He was bishop of the Mother Church. We know of him from the Act of the Apostles, the discussion about whether the Church had to accept or not accept the Gentiles. And then the other Apostle, Philip, was an Apostle that went out to the pagans. He did that in Hierapolis in Turkey. He was very famous for being a great preacher and a great exorcist. They are both very unique, these two Apostles, and James died in Jerusalem, thrown from the wall of the temple and was then beaten to death, and Philip was crucified probably the other way around, though there are multiple stories about that. The relics can be visited until May the 15th, but the church will remain open and represents a significant place to visit in this year of mercy. 
In this episode, we keep talking about the post-synodal apostolic exhortation Amoris Laetitia. In chapter 7 of the document, the Pope explained that the home must continue to be the place where we learn to appreciate the meaning and beauty of the faith, to pray and to serve our neighbor. In the world, there are countless examples of how this education in the faith not only shapes future vocations and solid marriages, but also strengthens the answer to the call to religious life. Recently, a special little Colombian family, as they call themselves, visited Rome. They're a group of brothers and cousins who learned their faith in the family, and out of it were born beautiful vocations to the priesthood. One of them is Bishop Noel Londoño of Jericho, Colombia. For more than 40 years, he's been a redemptorist missionary, and he introduced us to his unique family. I would like to introduce my older brother, Nelson. He is almost 18 years working as a missionary outside Colombia. He's a Sulpician priest, and now he works at the Shrine of the Sulpicians in Montreal, Canada. My older brother is Norbario. He is known in Colombia as a missionary. He is also a Sulpician. For six years, he was the rector of the seminary in Brazil. My youngest brother is celebrating his 25 years as a priest. That is why we're here in Rome, to celebrate that with him. His name is Norby, 25 years old, and he was ordained in the Archdiocese of Brasilia, and since then he's always been in Brazil. There are also two nephew priests, my nephew Jorge Mario, who is currently working in Canada. Since he was a priest 18 years ago, he has worked in Brazil and Canada. And the last of our nephews is Oscar Alberto, who's celebrating 15 years of his ordination to the priesthood, and since then he lived in Brazil in the Diocese of Londrina in southern Brazil. We have the joy of being together and serving the people of God. That is what really unites us. But not all vocations in this family were born in the same way. I have been a priest for 47 years. I was ordained by Blessed Pope Paul VI at the Eucharistic Congress in Bogota. I have worked in different places, very satisfied, and always thinking that God has called me to the priesthood. I never thought about retiring. I did not rule out other possibilities, but once I was a priest, I worked with all the ups and downs and difficulties of life, and here I am, very happy every time that a vocation appears in the family, like my brothers and my nephews. I think the first of the influences was the family. My mom had a cousin priest and my dad also had a cousin priest. And the house was regularly visited by those priests. So by necessity we have had that contact. Then my two older brothers had left the house for the seminary. So I entered as a contradiction because I thought maybe called them. And the call that I heard was not for me. So I must stay back and I must not move from here. But finally, at the end of high school, I had made the decision and it came to my consciousness that I was called. It was like if God had told me, well, if I had 10 siblings and he called the 10th, what are you going to say? No matter the number of those who were called, then I went on to the seminary. My family didn't believe it at first, but when I took the suitcase to leave, they were happy too. For the fourth brother, family prayer was important for his vocational decision. And for one of his cousins, family support was also central. My mother was always a woman of prayer. My parents went to daily mass. They prayed the rosary every night at home. And all this joined for a vocational awakening in me. I was very lucky to have had their example. The challenge of saying, because there are already three in my family, why one more? But even though there were persecutions and all, there were also opportunities to overcome. And so I have done it in these years of service. I have always wanted to be a priest, despite so many other things that I also liked to work, to do something for the people. I always got the good example of my family, also the call and the help from them. The day I decided I wanted to be a priest, I received a lot of support from my parents and also from my family. The fact of going to Brazil to study was for me something really big. It was really nice, that call of God. 
and I wanted to offer it up, and I always felt very happy. Now I have little more than 18 years of the priesthood. The youngest cousin of the group also wanted to leave a message to those who hear the call of the Lord in their own heart. Courage, most of all. Second, that God does not call the smartest and the most qualified, but enables with his call to launch into deeper water. Since they exercise their ministry in different countries, coming together is difficult. That's why their visit to Rome was an opportunity to be together and to see the Holy Father. They participated in the morning mass in the chapel of Domus Santa Marta. To meet the Pope, to receive the Pope's blessing, to kiss the Pope's ring, well, it was a party. Something really unusual, very happy, very happy to be there. To share with them and to tell the world to come, to become priests. We need you. Work with the church. It's worth it. It is beautiful. We're happy. None has given up, at least not so far. And we don't cry either. With this beautiful example of a family educated in faith, another phrase of the Holy Father from Amoris Laetitia can apply. In and among families, the gospel message should always resound. The core of that message, the kerygma, is what is most beautiful, most excellent, most appealing, and at the same time, most necessary. We know the love God has for us.